Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless you and thank you so very, very much for joining me for our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath. And thank you for keeping our Father's Seventh Day Sabbath, the day that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations forever. Once again, I'm Pastor Scott Delane with Holy Impact Ministries, and this morning we have an excellent study for you concerning the Feast of Tabernacles, and a little bit of the Day of Atonement uh, is well. We're going to finish that up and uh, move into, this is part four of our Feast Day 2024 uh, study series. And so if you have not caught the first three parts of this particular study, you can find them at our website at holyimpactministries.com. We'll take you there in just a moment to show you where all of that is. The downloadable PDF files for these studies will also be available uh, at the end of this particular study. I'll try to get that together for you and put it in a zip file where you can download it. And uh, that will have uh, the basic manuscripts, all of the slide work, everything that you need to take this uh, and to teach it yourself or to put together your own study uh, to share all of this information with others. Uh, and so that will be made available uh, for you over at our website at holyimpactministries.com, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, it has been a crazy week this week, and uh, I am just so glad to be at uh, our Father's Seventh-day Sabbath today. Um, there is a lot going on, and uh, we have certainly had our hands uh, full here uh, this week uh, at the ministry, and uh, we know that you probably have too with everything that is going on in the world today. Uh, but we are going to take the time this morning to once again go through the scripture line by line, line by line, precept by precept, precept by precept. We're going to talk about why all of these uh, fall feast days, as well as the spring day uh, feast days, are important to be teaching to our children as true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christians. And so if you are new to this, if you've been sitting in a denominational church pew for any number of years, if you've never heard any of this, if you don't know why this is important, uh, again, we are so glad to have you, and we're so glad that you're here. And we just want to uh, put some things in your hearing so that you can take these things and test them through the fire of prayer. And so, uh, once again, we're very glad to have you, and thank you for joining us. So I want to say welcome to everybody out there at YouTube, everybody at Odyssey, everybody at the Holy Impact Ministries website, Facebook, wherever it is that you're watching uh, this particular uh, video from. God bless you, and thank you for taking the time to, to view it. So, with that being said, uh, everybody, uh, as uh, most of you know, my wife Wanda uh, is not feeling well. She has cancer. She's going through chemotherapy. She just got out of the hospital yesterday. Uh, there was bacteria, a uh, bacteria infection in her blood. They had to take her port for her chemotherapy out and put another one in and cleanse her blood and do all of these things, and uh, so she is back home. Please keep her in prayer as well as Sister Madison as well. I wanted to mention her as well. She also has been fighting cancer gallantly, and uh, they have sent her home. Uh, as she has had uh, all of the treatment that she can possibly have, and so please keep Sister Madison and her family, Sister Janine and Sister Say and Brother John and everybody uh, there in a prayer, if you would. Uh, again, uh, please, my friends, Pray for the assembly. Pray for the assembly. Uh, we are living in perilous times, and uh, this cancer is something that is just uh, so many people either have it, uh, have had it, or are on the verge of getting it. Uh, it's in our water. It's in our food. It's in the air. It, it is. They've literally polluted everything. And so it is uh, my contention that uh, we are simply just waiting our turn. Everybody's just just waiting their turn. Uh, also, please keep uh, Brother Tim uh, in prayer as well. Uh, again, there are so many people in the assembly that are battling this or uh, battling this with a family member, Sister Teresa, so many people. And so please, uh, my friends, don't forget to pray this season. Uh, these are indeed the last days that we are now living in. And the devil is doing everything that he can to test each and every one of us and to get our minds off of what is important. And what is important is expanding his soon-coming kingdom that is soon to come. 
And so we need to stay focused on what is important uh, in these last days and, and not allow anything to, uh, to take our minds off of that. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that being said, everybody, please remember uh, to keep your brothers and sisters uh, in prayer this season. With that being said, uh, everybody, uh, I wanted everybody to know that uh, we had a fellowship this last uh, day of trumpets. Uh, I didn't get the email out soon enough. I don't think I was there. Nobody was there uh, because I don't think we got it out fast enough. Uh, I was going to put it out a couple of days beforehand uh, because of everything that was going on uh, that didn't get done. And I apologize for that. Uh, for those of you uh, who did try to attend that, uh, I, I just want to apologize uh, about that. It was there. We had it open. Uh, but when I was there, nobody was there. I don't think uh, people got the email in time. We will be having another uh, electronic fellowship on the Day of Atonement, which is coming up Thursday, the next Thursday, on the 12th. And uh, I will do everything that I possibly can to be there for at least part of that fellowship as well. Uh, that will be between 3 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we'll send that out to you through uh, our email uh, address. Uh, we'll show you how to get on that email address, uh, that email uh, mailing list, if you would like to have an invitation to that. Uh, once again, uh, everybody, it has just been uh, very, very difficult, and I, and I have to apologize for uh, uh, not being able to answer all of the emails that have been coming in. We have a lot of emails that have been coming in, a lot of people asking a lot of questions. We've gotten through a lot of them. S some of them still are unanswered just yet. Uh, we are working on that and getting uh, those answered as well. A lot going on, a lot going on. I have another project that I am working on as well. I won't mention that too much about that today. Uh, with that will come out a little bit later on. Uh, so uh, there's just a lot going on. And uh, we want to make sure that we are focusing, especially this season, on what is important. And that is expanding our Father's uh, in Heaven's soon coming kingdom. It is coming, my friends. It is coming at us like a freight train. And uh, I am very excited uh, about that. So with that being said, everybody, I want to take everybody over to the website here very quickly before we get started. So let's go over to the website here. This is our website, holyimpactministries.com. We are today in Wooster, Ohio, uh, for our fellowship. Uh, again, uh, I want everybody to know that we have this fellowship in Wooster, Ohio. If you are in the vicinity of Wooster, Ohio, uh, if you are passing through, if you're coming up, if you're going to be in the area, uh, please let me know. Uh, we would love to have you to come and uh, visit us for our fellowship uh, that we have the first and the third Saturday of every month. Uh, we will be back in Wooster, Ohio again, September 21st of 2024. So that will be the next fellowship that we will have. Uh, if you would like to join that and, and join with us, please email me at Pastor V, that's V as in Victor, at him.church. That's Pastor V at him.church. And uh, I will send you the logistics and where to be and what time and all that kind of thing. We'd be we'd just be elated uh, if you could just stick your head in the door and just say, hey, you know, I'm here. We're with you and uh, and have a little bit of fellowship. So once again, uh, that will be September 21st of 2024 will be the next one. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there if you could make it. Uh, once again, I'd like to mention our uh, Holy Impact Ministries mailing list. Uh, if you would subscribe to that, uh, we'll let you know what's going on when we're having these fellowships and what have you, what we are doing, what is being postponed, uh, what new thing is coming out. Uh, this is how we get a hold of everybody at the ministry. And so if you would sign up for that, we would greatly appreciate that. I want to say thank you again to everybody uh, who is contributing to the ministry. It is, it has been a a major blessing for us, especially in this season that uh, my wife and I are in right now. Uh, I cannot I cannot thank you uh, enough. The, the kindness and the cards and the and the letters that have been coming in and the testimonials. Thank you so very very much for doing that. We we simply could not do what we do without uh, our brothers and sisters. And so once again, I want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, out there. We we love you and we care for you so very much, and it really does make a difference. And we pray over each and every uh, person who, who prays for the ministry, who contributes to the ministry. Thank you for doing that. Uh, you are certainly not forgotten. Uh, you are certainly in our hearts and in our minds. 
With that being said, everybody, uh, we're going to take a short break here for a couple of minutes. And when we come back, we're going to get into how do we keep the Day of Atonement? And what's this big deal about the Feast of Tabernacles? Stay with us. I think you'll be glad you did. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you so very, very much for staying with me this morning. And so, 
One of the things that I'd like to touch on before we get started into the Feast of Tabernacles and, and why this is so monumental for us to be teaching our children and our children's children is how and why should a modern-day Christian be keeping the Day of Atonement? And, and how do we keep the Day of Atonement? Now, this, again, is uh, part uh, three of this particular, or four of this particular study. And so we've already covered a lot of the Day of Atonement in our last study. Uh, today, we're just going to be kind of finishing that up a little bit. And before we move into uh, uh, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles portion of this study. And so the first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to turn to Leviticus chapter 23. And I'd like to read about the Day of Atonement and how is the Day of Atonement supposed to be kept. So let's read that together. We can find that in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 through 32. Let's read this together. It says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to Yahuwah. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahovah your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. And so this is the commanded way that the house of Israel is supposed to keep the Day of Atonement. Now, uh, I have, uh, from time to time, uh, I have people that will say to me, well, you know, uh, Jesus died on the cross for me, so I don't have to be bothered with any of this stuff. So I don't have to be bothered with being atoned. My sin's already been atoned for, and I don't have to worry about any of these things. Well, my friends, once again, I would like you to understand that our Father in Heaven commanded us to keep these things forever and throughout our generations. He did not say, until my son comes, or until I change my mind, or until further notice. He commands his people to keep this day in remembrance. And I have, uh, every once in a while, somebody say to me, well, if my sins have already been atoned for, then why do I need to, to keep this? Once again, my friends, uh, I'd like to read for you what our Father in Heaven says about the house of Israel, that we true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christians have been grafted into. Uh, and again, my friends, our Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, who came and was born of the body of David into the tribe of Judah, just as we are told in 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you don't know the identity of your Messiah, my friends, please read 2 Samuel chapter 7 to know who he is and where he came from and what, he, what this is all about. Again, and what we are grafted into as Christians, uh, again, uh, our Messiah, born of the, from the body of David, uh, into the tribe of Judah, who the ruler's staff still remains between the feet of, right? Uh, we need to know that. We need to understand that. Always kept all of his father's commanded feast days and appointments. And we are commanded to pick up our crosses and to walk as he walked. Not as the church walked, not as some denominational empire walks, as he, the Messiah, walked. Now, keeping that in mind, I would like everybody to know and to understand exactly why it is that our Father in Heaven is going to forgive the house of Israel and all the twelve tribes of Israel. Why is that? Why? Why is it? Why is he going to, uh, again, forgive the Jews? Why is he doing all of this? And what is all of this about? Because this directly ties into the Day of Atonement that we need to, as modern-day Christians, understand. So, from here, 
Uh, I would like to take you over very quickly to uh, uh, Ezekiel, uh, chapter 36, verses 22 through 32. And I'd like to read to you about the Day of Atonement, about our Messiah, and how all of this ties in. Okay, so let's do a little bit of reading, line by line, line by line, precept by precept, precept by precept, so that we might get a better understanding of what the Day of Atonement should mean to us today as modern-day Christians. Let's go read that very quickly here. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22 through 32 says this, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says Yahovah, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am Yahovah, declares Yahovah, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your land. And again, this has more to do with that greater exodus that is we talked about uh, during our last study, uh, when our Messiah, the second Moses, the prophet likened unto Moses, according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, will, will bring us, all of us, back into that land that Yahuwah God had promised. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. My friends, this has already been done. I want us to understand that. I want us to know that. How did he do this? How did he remove the stone of uh, the, the heart of stone? He did it through allowing Yeshua, our Passover lamb, to be the atonement for our sin. This is how he did it, my friends. Anybody who understands what our Messiah did for us because of our wickedness, because of our foul stench, anybody who understands that our Messiah laid his life down for us as a wicked people has already had that stony heart broken and a heart of flesh put within them. And so this has already been done, my friends. He says, I will put my spirit within you. This was done during Pentecost, also known as Shavuot, which is the exact same day when the law was given through the Ruach HaKodesh and written across our hearts and in our minds, just as we see in, once again, Jeremiah chapter 31 of the Old Testament, Hebrews chapter 10 of the New Testament. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. And I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. And I will make the fruit of the tree increase in the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Now listen to what he says here in verse 31 and 32. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and for your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares Yahuwah God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Now notice here in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 31 and 32, this is after he breaks that stony heart, after he writes his law in our hearts, if he, after he puts his spirit within us so that we will walk in his ways and so that we will walk in his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. My friends, this is what the Day of Atonement is all about for today's modern-day Christian. We remember why it is that our Messiah had to lay his life down for us. We loathe ourselves. We remember a, each and every year. We remember these things. And this is why the Day of Atonement is a day of affliction. We are to afflict ourselves. We are to realize 
that God saved us not because we are a good people, not because we are a good people, but for his name's sake and because of the promises that he made that the Apostle Paul tells us in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans are irrevocable. The calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable. And so this day is a day that we remember what our Messiah did and why he did it for us because of our wickedness. This is a day of cleansing, a day that we pray and we ask the one true mediator between God and man, who is Yeshua. We confess our sins to him and we ask him to continue as our high priest in the order of Melchizedek to keep us clean in the eyes of God. Who can keep us clean in the eyes of God? No one other than the man, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ. And so, once again, my friends, all of this has to do with the Day of Atonement and why it was from the very beginning that God tells us to keep this day forever and throughout your generations, not just until his son comes, not just until he changes his mind, not just until further notice, but forever and for always, my friends. In the Hebrew language, which is the language they spoke back then, could God have said, uh, I want you to just keep this until my son comes, just till I send that second prophet like unto Moses, just till I send you uh, your Passover lamb? Could he have said that? Are there words in the Hebrew language that could have conveyed this? Yes, there is. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. And I have heard pastors uh, from Timbatu try to manipulate that particular... Oh, it, he didn't really mean forever and throughout your generations. My friends, again, I would like you to remember that according to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 12, it is a sin, it is a transgression of the law, God's spoken word, to add to his word or to take away from his word. Is your church adding to God's word? Is your church taking away from God's word? Because if it is... It is sinful, and it is a transgression. They have returned like a dog to their vomit and like a pig to its mire after being cleansed. So do we understand the importance of this in the eyes of our Father in heaven? And do we understand why it is written that many are called, but few are chosen? Straight is the gate, narrow is the path, and few there be that find it. Not everybody finds it. Few there be that find it. And so, once again, uh, as we come upon the Day of Atonement, it is a Sabbath. It is a day of rest. It is a day of reflection. It is a day of humility. And it is a day that we exalt Him, Yahovah God, not us. It is a day of getting rid of our vanity. Any humanly, fleshly vanity that we have goes. It is, a, it is a cleaning of our temples. Remember, the Ruach HaKodesh lives with you in your spirit, right? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, my friends. Again, humility. Uh, is what the Day of Atonement is all about in remembering what was done for us and why it was done for us so that we don't return like a dog to its vomit and we don't return like a pig to its mire. These are the things we should be teaching our children, not lavishing them with candy and presents, my friends, which is another whole story we don't have time for here this morning. So I, I just wanted to bring those things to your attention and help you to understand what the Day of Atonement is all about and why it's a big deal. And so, once again, very, very important. And so as we continue on uh, this morning with our study into the fall feast days, we're going to also be focusing primarily on what is known as the last actual feast day of God's calendar year, which is also known as Sukkot, or Tabernacle. This particular feast day is also referred to as the Feast of Booths because it's this time of the year that God uh, calls his people to come to where he is, where he has put his name, 
and to live in booths or tents for seven days out of the year in order to, once again, the, all of these feast days are to remind us, to remind us of things, to remind his people of how Yahuwah God had rescued them from the sin and bondage of Egypt and how his people had to live in the wilderness relying on him and him alone. And this is something that I want to talk about for just a moment. Today, we are living in a fallen Babylonian world. The world has literally become Babylon. And I hear a lot of people arguing over, what's Babylon? Is it, is it, uh, is it the United States? Is it New York? Is it Mecca? Is it uh, uh, the Vatican? Uh, you know, where, what's this Babylon? My friends, Babylon is anything that has to do with false religion. The whore of Babylon is the one who once again perpetrates and continues to teach and preach a false religion adding to God's word, taking away from God's word, just like the Pharisees were doing, who are Messiah called twofold children of hell. Is this important to understand? Yes, my friends. And, and I tell you the truth. If the pastors of Yeshua's time, who were the Pharisees and the scribes, were twofold children of hell because they were adding to the word of God and taking away from the word of God, what do you think the church is doing today? And what do you think that our Messiah thinks about the church today, who has done anything and everything that they possibly can to make void the word of God in order to hold on to their own tradition? Think, my friends, about these things. Think, especially about this season. This is the season to think about these things, to contemplate these things, to understand what we have done to the word of God and, uh, and how egregious it is in his eyes to do these things and not pay attention to what we should be paying attention to. This particular feast day, known as Tabernacles or Sukkot, is actually uh, a true feast day. And we've talked about this before. Not all of God's appointments are actually feast days. We call them feast days in general, uh, but they're not all feast days. And so this is something that I uh, wanted to, uh, once again, point us to here very quickly here. Hold on here just a second. It looks like, hold on here just a second. Every once in a while that happens here. Hold on. Give me just a second and I will pull this up. We need to have this slide here. I have a slide for you here that I wanted you to see and I did not load it apparently. Give me just a second and uh, I will get that loaded here for us. Every once in a while, that for some reason, it doesn't keep my file when I do this. There it is. That's what I want right there. Okay, now let me get back to the beginning here. There it is. All right. Very good. Okay, so these, once again, are, are the feast days or the appointments uh, of Yahuwah God. Again, we have appointments in the spring. We have appointments in the fall. Not all of these are... Uh, feast days, as we previously revealed earlier in our study series. People oftentimes call all of God's appointments feast days. However, there are really only three actual feast days that qualify as biblical feast days. The Feast of Tabernacles, outlined in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33 through 43, was one of the three major pilgrimage festivals of God's yearly ordained calendar. The first one was the Passover and Unleavened Bread. Now, both the Passover meal and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were invariably seen as one appointment because the Passover was actually a, pre a preparation day, if you will. It was a day of preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that the house of Israel prepared to enter into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because the Passover was meant to serve as a preparation day for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover and Unleavened Bread are oftentimes seen as one event and not two separate events. This is why the titles Passover and Unleavened Bread oftentimes uh, are used interchangeably within the Scripture. And I'd like to read a couple of those for you. Luke chapter 21 verse 1 says this, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread New Year drew near, which is called the Passover. And so do you see that? Again, the, the names were oftentimes used interchangeably. Here's another one, Mark chapter 14, verse 12. On the first day of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the 
Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And so, uh, once again, this is very important that we see that these are, uh, these are actually seen as one appointment, not two separate appointments, as we oftentimes talk about. And so, therefore, this would have been the first pilgrimage when the house of Israel was commanded to come before God. There are three pilgrimages uh, throughout the year that God calls his people to come to where he has put his name, which, again, is in Jerusalem. The second pilgrimage would have been the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost or Shavuot, which comes seven weeks or 50 days after the Passover. This particular spring feast celebrates our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, who is Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, delivering the Ruach HaKodesh, also known as the Holy Spirit, to those who would choose to go down into that watery grave of baptism and be raised up a new creature with the intent of picking up their crosses and following him and walking as he walked. The third and final uh, feast day that would have been a pilgrimage for the house of Israel to come before Yehovah God would have been Tabernacles, which is the only actual feast day that occurs in the fall at the end of the year. As we've shown throughout our previous studies within this series of feast day studies, each one of these appointments and each one of these feast days represents how Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, became the Word of God by executing what God the Father had spoken down to the very letter of what our Father in Heaven had spoken. And this particular feast day, also known as Tabernacles or Sukkot, is no different. This feast day and appointment with God also has a deep-seated spiritual connection to the future. After the 1,000-year millennial reign of Yeshua upon the earth, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth and finally ushers his chosen set-apart remnant people into his new coming kingdom. Tabernacles represents not only the end, my friends, but tabernacles also represents a new beginning for all of Yahuwah God's chosen set-apart remnant people. The Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, represents the new thing that God is in the process of doing right now, in our time, before our very eyes. After that trumpet sounds, and it will sound, after the earth atones for its sins, and it will atone for its sins, sin and death will be done away with, and those who are left, because they have endured to the end, and they have conquered over evil, will be ushered into God's newly created kingdom, which will finally bring an end to crying and to mourning and pain and death, for all of these things will have finally passed away. Let's take the time to read about that day and what's, what it's going to be like and just what will take place on that glorious day. We can find that in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, and I'd like to read those to you here this morning. So let's go read those so that we can know what the future has to say about these things and how the Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled. Beginning with Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Remember now in the book of Matthew that our Messiah said, that not one crossing of a T, not one dotting of an I, would pass from the law or be made void from the law until heaven and earth pass away. Well, when does that happen? It happens right here, my friends. And again, this is after the 1,000-year millennial reign of our Messiah, after all of these things have taken place. This is what happens. Again, the old earth and the old heaven that we're living in right now today will pass away, and a new heaven and a new earth will be brought forth by our Father in heaven. It continues and says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself 
will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things will have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. Once again, my friends, when are all things accomplished? Again, the church teaches that all things were accomplished at the foot of the cross after the death of our Messiah. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that all things are done here at the end of the age, after the 1,000-year millennial reign of our Messiah, after he has returned, after he has caused the earth to atone for its sin. Here, in Revelation chapter 21, all things are accomplished. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers, now get this, my friends, not just endures, but the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall, the twelve gates and the twelve uh, gates uh, the, the, at the end, and at the gates, twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod twelve thousand stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, and the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh crystallite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, and the tenth christophrase, and the eleventh jacknath, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun nor moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Continuing on, Revelation chapter 22, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding each fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light 
and they will reign for ever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard them and when I saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the assemblies. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua. The grace of the Lord Yeshua be with all. Amen. My friends, this last feast day of the year has everything to do with salvation. It has everything to do with the hope that we've been given. It has everything to do with reminding us of this new thing that God is in the process of doing for you and I. This particular feast day has several layers of meanings, my friends, and it's important that we acknowledge why our Father in Heaven wants us to keep it in remembrance forever and throughout our generation. Tabernacles, first of all, represents our giving thanks to God for the year's harvest and for the ingathering of crops, symbolizing God's provision for God's people. Tabernacles is also a commemoration of the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness, while God himself took care of them, even though they were disobedient to him. The booths that Yehovah God commands the house of Israel to live in were significant in more ways than one. This Feast of Tabernacles points to a future time for us, just as it did for the house of Israel. Back then, Tabernacles pointed to the house of Israel entering into the promised land, but that promised land was only a temporary promised land. The promised land that we Christians look forward to today is a land that will remain forever and always throughout eternity because it is a new thing that God is doing. These temporary booths, these temporary dwellings, were a physical reminder of the transitory nature of human life and the ultimate hope of a permanent home with Yahuwah God, our Father in Heaven, the Creator of all things seen and unseen. The prophetic dimension of the Feast of Tabernacles finally reaches its realization in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation that we've just read. When we read in Revelation chapter 21 that the dwelling place of God will be with man, we must understand that the Greek word for dwelling place is the Greek word skene, and skene literally means tent or tabernacle. 
This is directly connected to the concept of tabernacling with God during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, which celebrates God's presence among the Israelites in their temporary shelters, now finds its ultimate fulfillment in the eternal tabernac tabernacling of God with humanity in a new heaven and a newly created earth. The temporary booze that the house of Israel lived in during the Feast of Tabernacles represented the transient nature of this present world. The Apostle Paul refers to the human body as an earthly tent in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which highlights the temporary dwelling place of humanity today. Just as the house of Israel lived in temporary shelters while awaiting their permanent home in the Promised Land, so too do we as Christians today live in a temporary fallen world while we await the promise of that permanent home within God's newly created kingdom to come. The Feast of Tabernacles reminds us all that this world that we live in today, with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, with all of its decay, is not the final destination of God's people. Salvation, in of itself, is a representation of God's redemptive plan to usher His chosen, set-apart remnant people into a restored, permanent creation where there will be no more crying, no more weeping, no more death, and no more separation from God. A day is soon coming when the presence of God will no longer be mediated through physical structures or symbols or prophets and priests. Yahuwah God's presence will be physical in nature and eternal forever, and man will, just as God intended, walk with God through the garden in the cool of the evening once again, just like Adam did. And man will once again be permitted to eat from the tree of life that he was so long ago banished from back in the Garden of Eden. The connection between the Feast of Tabernacles and the new heaven and the new earth can also be seen in Zechariah chapter 14, when Zechariah tells us that all those who survive of all of the nations of the earth that come up against Jerusalem shall once again go up every year to worship him at his feast of booths during the 1,000-year millennial reign of Yeshua upon the earth. Let's read that in Zechariah chapter 14 again a very important scripture to know and to understand. Once again, turning to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19 says this, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, Yahovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of booze. My friends, this is after the return of Yeshua to the earth. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahovah of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up to present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which Yahovah afflicts the nations. Now again, my friends, this is not about the house of Israel. This is about the nations of the earth. He's not calling the twelve tribes of Israel here. He's calling the nations of the earth that have survived, that have come against Jerusalem. Okay, so this again is after the return of Yeshua to the earth when he causes the earth to atone for its sins. Okay, so once again, all those nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booze will have no rain on them. There will be a plague. They will still be learning who the God of Israel is for that thousand-year millennial reign of our Messiah. It continues on. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. The final vision of the new Jerusalem descending from heaven in Revelation chapter 21 symbolizes the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles and all that it was meant to to anticipate. A time when God himself would once again live and breathe among man, just as he had done in the beginning with Adam. Is this important to understand? You be the judge.
The very reason that our Father in Heaven commanded His people to keep all of these feast days and all of these appointments in remembrance forever and throughout our generations is because each and every one of them represented the new thing that God was in the process of doing to restore man back to his rightful place as sons of God. Every single one of these feast days and appointments should be remembered by every single Christian today in our time. And we ought to be teaching these feast days and these appointments to our children. Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, became our Passover lamb. He was the unleavened, sinless bread of life, the first fruit of the resurrection and the deliverer of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God himself to mankind. And he will return with the sound of a trump in order to destroy every rule, every authority, and every earthly power in order to make the earth atone for its sin and transgression. And when it is all over, he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20-24 through 24. But in fact, the Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in the Messiah shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. The Messiah, the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to the Messiah. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Every single solitary one of Yahuwah God's feast days and appointments will ultimately be fulfilled by the Lamb of God, the prophet likened unto Moses, the bread of life, the first fruit of the resurrection, the Lion of Judah, who the ruler's staff still remains between the feet of, the Son of David, Son of Abraham, the Son of Man, who will sit upon the throne of David, his human father, forevermore, because he did become the Word of God by fulfilling every word ever spoken by God his Father. How could we have missed this? How could we have traded the word of God for the word of such foolish men? How could we have not seen what God was doing right before our very eyes? How could we have made void the word of God in order to hold on to our own tradition? The very same way that the pastors of Yeshua's time could not see who he was standing right there in front of them. The devil has his ways, his traps, his snares, and he is indeed the master of deception, and he is wonderfully brilliant at what he does. You have to hand it to him. He is indeed a worthy adversary. But now, now that we know, now that we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear in these last days, what will we do with the truth that we have heard? What will we do with the truth that has been made known to us? My hope and my prayer is that we will continue to do and not just hear, to act and not just see. Today in our time, many are indeed coming. Many people are doing all that they can to practice each one of our Father in Heaven's feast days and appointments to the very best of their abilities. But please also know this. It is not wise for us to become overly pious, as the Pharisees and the scribes had done. When we think of ourselves as overly holy, or holier than thou, if you will, we do no one, including ourselves, any service. Please make note of the commandment that Yahuwah gives his people concerning these three pilgrimages 
uh, of the year in Deuteronomy chapter 16. This is important to, to look at. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 16 and 7. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before Yahovah your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. You shall not appear before Yahovah empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of Yahovah your God that he has given you. Yahuwah God once again reminds us that these three pilgrimages, these three feast days and appointments, are to be at the place that He, God, will choose. So where did God choose to put His name? Again, this is important to understand. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. My friends, where is God? Where did he put his name? Jerusalem. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city out of all of the tribes of Israel in which to build my house, that my name might be there. And I chose no man as prince over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 4, And he built altars in the house of Yehovah, of which Yehovah had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. My friends, there's only one place where Yahovah God has put his name, and that's Jerusalem. And in the end, when our Messiah returns to the earth to tread the winepress of the wrath of God, all who survive that event will be commanded to once again come to Jerusalem and to keep Yahovah God's feast of booze, also known as tabernacles or Sukkot. At this point in time, Jerusalem is quickly becoming a war-torn city, and the Gentiles are indeed trampling the city as we speak. But I tell you the truth, all, that is, all of that, my friends, is going to change. Once that trumpet sounds, once these fall feast days spring into action, and they will, and once that great and terrible day of Yehovah is over, we will all once again be traveling to Jerusalem from around the world, and Yahuwah God will make a way, and it will be done, and his new kingdom will arrive in its good time. But until then, it's up to us to continue to carry our crosses and to bear the burden of this wicked world, just as our Messiah and King did when he was here. It's up to us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. It's up to us to expand his soon coming kingdom until we get to where it is that we're going, no matter what the devil does to us. Yeshua came to show us how it's done, how to endure to the end, how to conquer over evil. All we have to do is to follow him. And God willing, follow him we will until the very end. But we can't do it alone. We can't do it without his Ruach Hukadesh, his Holy Spirit living and dwelling within us, just as it was with Yeshua. We need that God-given Spirit living and breathing within us in order to endure to the end and to conquer over evil. So please, Please, my friends, do not grieve that Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Stay the course through thick and thin. The time is short, and the sand is leaving the hourglass as we speak. It's not about another man, or another church, or a theology, or a religion. It's not about a pastor, or a rabbi, or a pope, 
or some man-made philosophical hermeneutical understanding. It's not about the Gnostics or the Judaizers or the Roman Catholics or the Stoics or the Epicureans or the Platonists. It's not about the ancient alien theorists. It's about the spoken word of God that our Messiah became and has commanded us to all follow him and also become. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 6. 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Not as the church walks, but as he walks. We could go on for days. We could go on for weeks and months about how these feast days and appointments teach us about what the Bible truly says. And we will. God willing. But in closing, I hope we've conveyed the most important concept in, in all of this. And that is that we each individually must read the book for ourselves. We, both individually and corporately, must study to show ourselves approved. We must renew our minds daily, for I tell you the truth. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. With that being said, my friends, I will do as I always do, and I will ask everyone within the sound of my voice to please take what you've heard here this morning to your own prayer closet. Bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you have heard here this morning be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on his door and his door alone so that the proper door can be opened unto you. And my friends, if you will do that, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon-coming kingdom together. It's been a blessing to be with you. Once again, I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries, and uh, it is always a blessing to go over these things and to reteach and to share all of this information. And my hope and my prayer is that you will take all of this and, and pray over all of these things and turn around and teach it to somebody else. Let them know. Help them to understand. Uh, these are the days, my friends, and they're, 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 the days are short. We don't have a lot of time to expand his soon coming kingdom, so we need to do all that we can now, today. With that in mind, the Day of Atonement falls on September 11th, which is uh, next Wednesday evening at sundown, and it will run through Thursday the 12th until sundown. And if you forget that, just go to holyimpactministries.com and just click on the feast day calendar. It'll pop right down there for you, and uh, you'll have that. So if you forget, just go to holyimpactministries.com. They're all laid out there. All of the new moons, all of the feast days are all laid out there for you. Uh, and so it's very convenient for you to go in and take a look at. But uh, again, therefore, because it will be uh, Wednesday at sundown, Thursday, we will be postponing our usual Wednesday evening Bible study next week, but we will return the next seventh-day Sabbath at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. With that being said, everybody, uh, I'd just like to say thank you once again for joining us, and thank you for sharing your time with me. It is just such a, a humbling time uh, that we have together to go through line by line, line by line, precept by precept, precept by precept, to know, to understand, and to test all of what God has spoken. With that being said, I'd like to say a quick prayer over us all, and then we will adjourn for our Father's seventh-day Sabbath. 
In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We give you thanks, Father, for all that you do. We give you thanks for your mercy and for your grace. We give you thanks for each and every one of these feast days that teach us so very much. Help us, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, to spread your word, to help other Christians know and understand that we ought not to be making void your word in order to hold on to our own traditions. We ought not to be listening to denominational empires of men. We ought not to be following the church, but following your lamb, your precious lamb, your Passover lamb that you have presented to us. Help us, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, to break those stony hearts of others who are sitting in church pews this very day, who do not know and have no concept of the truth or what your word says or what these feast days are meant to remind us of. Help us this day of atonement to get rid of any vanity that is in our hearts. Help us to once again make ourselves clean so that our high priest in the order of Melchizedek can once again make offerings on our behalf to you, Father in heaven. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, and we give you thanks, Messiah Yeshua. Thank you for laying your life down as you have done and for being our Passover lamb. In the name of Yeshua, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Once again, my friends, I can't thank you enough. It humbles me to be here. It is a uh, just a great time to, whenever we get a chance to share all of this information, and I encourage you to take these four studies and to share them with the world. Be the light of the world and the salt of the earth that preserves the Word of God. Until next time, everyone. Shabbat Shalom.